We say water is life, but we often forget that the water cycle and the life cycle are one. How much do we actually know about water and how much do we believe in the fact that water is our most abundant substance, that water is so entwined in us, we often forget it is there, from food to sanitation and maintaining our ecosystems around the world, water is our most essential need to survive. We know that we are in a global climate crisis, but globally, our waters are also threatened and we are facing a global water crisis, or as Kava Medani calls it, a state of water bankruptcy. If we want to address these crises in our lifetime, we need to change and transform the way in which we value water and think about ways to protect and conserve our life-giving water resources. We often imagine that the world is filled with infinite water. In fact, it is not. This planet has very finite fresh water resources. It is estimated that by 2030, up to 700 million people could be displaced worldwide due to water scarcity. It is time to address this crisis. We must change and we must do so now before it is too late. For without blue, there is no green. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Water for All session. My name is Shuka Bidarian, and I will be serving as the moderator of this session. We will start with a keynote speaker and a keynote speech, and we will move on to our incredible panel discussion. And at the end, we are going to have an exclusive interview, one of the world leading water scientists. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Welcome to the stage, our keynote speaker, Sabine Stauffer, CMO and co-founder of Hydroloop Systems. Sabine, over to you. Yes, hello. Thank you very much, uh, Shuka, and thank you so much for that introduction. Very well said. You know, water is our most precious resource. We call it our blue gold, and it's the beginning of food and life itself. And may I just say, I'm so honored to be here today at Change Now to tell you more about our vision, which is, it's actually a very simple solution. It is to use water twice. And you know that if we start to recycle at home, 250 billion liters of water can be recycled, reused uh, and saved every single day. That's an incredible amount. Now, many people on our planet are aware of the value of water. For example, the 2 billion people that already have no access to clean water. But also closer to home, Belgium, for example, is number 21 on the world list of driest countries. And often we think that these problems are far away, but they actually are much closer than most of us realize. And for some of us, it's still hard to comprehend that water is a finite resource. Because when you open up the tap at home, water abundantly flows out at very little cost. Now, water may not be expensive yet, but it is very valuable. And water impacts everyone and everywhere. The water crisis is an increasing global risk with 14 of the world's 20 megacities experiencing water scarcity or drought conditions. Water in terms of impact has been one of the top risks in the World Economic Forum Global Risks Report over the last nine years. And the list of cities experiencing water crises continues to grow. Cities like London, Miami, Atlanta and Los Angeles, to name a few, are all heading towards day zero, with the current average water use per day in developing countries being as high as 500 litres in some cities. A key action towards tackling the looming water crisis would be to reduce consumption, positively disrupt urban domestic water use, and facilitate circular economy solutions. Our world is still in the midst of the worst health emergency in over a century, but there is hope because humanity is rising to the challenge. 
The global efforts against COVID-19, including the collaboration and innovation required to develop a vaccine in under a year, is evidence of what is possible when the world pulls together in the face of a common threat. We have learned what it means to pull together in the face of a truly global crisis. Now, let me tell you about the hydrologic cycle, which has been able to supply our world for billions of years with sufficient water supply. Water evaporates, forms clouds which travel, and the precipitation falls out of the clouds. 70% of that is lost in the seas, and only 30% falls on the land, where it will be captured in ice and snow caps, rivers, and where it will replenish aquifers and groundwater levels. But how much water is actually available? Well, to give you an idea of how much water is really available for us humans to use, here are some numbers. 97% of the Earth's water is found in the oceans, which is too salty for drinking or growing any crops. 3% of the Earth's water is fresh. And 2.5% of the Earth's fresh water is unavailable because it is locked up in glaciers, polar caps, atmosphere, is highly polluted or it lies too far under the Earth's surface to be extracted at an affordable cost. 0.5% of the Earth's water is actually available fresh water. If the world's water supply were only 100 litres, our usable water supply of fresh water would be only half a teaspoon. Now I'm sure that you have all read these kinds of headlines or experienced the very dry summers of the last couple of years. And as I said, the hydrologic cycle has been sufficient for billions of years, but it is already insufficient for growing demand. And climate change, population growth, sinking groundwater levels, and a population growth of 2 billion more people in the coming 30 years is only to seriously increase, increase these problems. So we really must change things now so that there will be water for future generations. And I'm really happy with the trends and visions of which I'd like to show you a few. The United Nations report that came out last World Water Day. Now they are stating that by 2050, the global population will reach 9 billion people, 55% of which will be living in cities. Water demand will increase by 55% worldwide. As such, wasteful use of water should be avoided. Instead, water should be reused or transformed into energy and secondary materials following circular economy principles. Or the double peer-reviewed study by the University of Ghent advocating using extreme decentralization to create resilient urban water systems. This paper advocates a third complementary route, household-based personalized water systems. Or let's look at the European Green Deal, which is a set of policy initiatives by the European Commission with the overarching aim of making Europe climate neutral in 2050. And I'm very happy to mention that my speaking here today at Change Now has been chosen by the European Union as a partner event for the European Green Week. Or let's look at the new European Bauhaus, which is a growing community interested in building beautiful, sustainable, inclusive places to live together. And the 50 Litre Home Coalition, a daughter company of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, which is spearheaded by giants such as Procter & Gamble, NG, Electrolux & Kohler, to name a few, who we are in discussion with for collaboration at the moment, that advocate the new home design and the education of residents that could transform a typical 500 litre per day user to just 50 litres per day without significant sacrifice. So these were some of the international trends and visions. And you know, interestingly, everything about sustainability, circular economy, circular and smart cities, it's mainly been focused on carbon footprint reduction and solar energy. And somehow water reusing and recycling seems to be a forgotten subject. So let me tell you about our vision about the future and talk about decentralized water recycling 
and creating a sustainable future with water for all by using water twice to lower your water consumption with 45% and retain comfort of living. Now, we can be so much more efficient in use of water. And we look at it like this. Every building has its own water source. And this is the lightly contaminated water from showers, baths, washing machines, hand basins, and condensation water from air conditions and heat pumps. And normally, all this water goes down the drain. It all goes together with the black water and it's transported away. But if we collect it at the building on the spot, we clean and disinfect it, it can thereafter be reused for purposes that do not need any tap water quality, like toilet flushing or the washing machine, garden irrigation, vegetable garden, or swimming pool top up. This way, you can save up to 45% on tap water and 45% on wastewater emission. So what would water recycling look like in an ordinary house? So here I've shown a little picture and uh, you know, somewhere on the ground floor level, the water recycler would be placed and the water from the shower and the bath would basically flow into the water recycler. And here the treatment takes place so that the water meets the highest international standards. And from there on, it is distributed to the toilets, the garden and the washing machine, all fully automatic. So without noticing anything, you'll be saving water, energy and money. And you're very, very sustainable. So what are the benefits of decentralized water recycling? Well, 45% savings on tap water consumption, 45% reduction, sorry, 45 reduction in wastewater, 45% savings on your water and your wastewater bills, energy reduction in areas with cooler winter climates, carbon footprint reduction, and an increased property value as it complies with increasing regulations and sustainability requirements and becoming more resilient and less dependent on the grid. But what would be the other options instead of water recycling? So what about rainwater? You know, many people ask us. Well, what about if there is no rainwater? And also we believe rainwater should be collected, um, but always reused outside the house. So it replenishes the groundwater levels. And what about desalination? Well. This is a very highly polluting to our planet and it's at a very high energy cost. So water recycling and using water twice inside the building makes sense as it ticks all the boxes when it comes to the UN SDGs, low maintenance, small footprint and being a home appliance. So I'd like to briefly show you our solutions that we have created for different purposes since 2018. So here you see the Hydroloop H300 for small families, and this is the 600 for larger families. And this is the Cascade for commercial use, so we can use it for hotels or sports clubs or airports or swimming pools. And this is the baby brother, the Hydroloop H150, which we are bringing out later this year, which will be for two to three person apartments concealed behind the wall. Now, we foresee that it's only a matter of time until all buildings will need to have decentralized water recycling systems stipulated by local governments and building codes. And therefore, we advocate that from now on, all new construction should be built future-proof and recycle-ready because new buildings can easily be prepared for the installation of water recycling. It makes the building future-proof and sustainable. It costs very, very little money to do this. And the residents can determine the moment for installing a water recycling system. It is our vision that in 10 years time, decentral water recyclers will have become a staple household consumer good, just like a fridge, air conditioner or a washing machine. Now to show you just a nice example, uh, one of the many that we're doing, this is a beautiful smart city blueprint project in the Netherlands. All 41 one homes are built future-proof, gas-free, energy from solar panels, and they're built with recycled building materials. And of course, all homes are recycle ready and fitted with a water recycling system. Now here, just some images of some proud water recyclers, one of our, some of our many customers that we already have. And this is also a customer. This is high end customers in the hospitality branch with luxury, luxury lodges in arid areas. 
Or, for example, a student flat in Belgium where millions of litres of water are recycled every year. Now, of course, it's been quite a journey to get where we are now. And we are very proud of the recognition that we have been receiving, uh, as you can see, the many awards, and that we contribute towards four of the UN SDGs. And we're also very proud that we feature in the Brave Blue World documentary on Netflix, starring Matt Damon, and showing all the solutions that are out there in the world to tackle the worldwide water problem. So if you haven't seen it yet, please go and do so. So ladies and gentlemen, we have the solutions to tackle this global challenge. The only thing we need to do is to implement them and start using them right now. I'm inspired by the global movement of people for water and sustainability. I strongly believe in the power of individual action. It's very easy to think that the actions of one million individual, uh, one individual will not make a difference because you're just one person among millions. But it's small actions taken by millions of people that can really make a difference and create change. We're all in it together. I'm optimistic because I can see a path forwards to a beautiful and water abundant future. And I'm excited to be a part of the solution. And I hope I've inspired you and that from now on, you'll be wise and use water twice. Water. The water we have today is the water we've always had. We all need water and can't live without. Every day we use water as it is a vital condition of life, but by 2040 most of the world will not have enough. Now, more than ever we know we must preserve our most precious resource, our blue gold. Our vision of the future? Use water twice. Hydroloop ensures perfect quality recycled water to substantially save on domestic water usage. We are the first to create turnkey products that empower people and organizations wherever they live with smart and affordable water recycling products without compromising on personal hygiene or quality of life and seriously contributing to one of the greatest challenges of mankind, drastically reducing the use of water. Wonderful. I like the slogan, be wise, use water twice. And the fact that other aspects of sustainability is included in this system, from reducing wastewater emissions to reducing carbon footprint and conserving energy. It has it all. Thank you, Sabine, for your time and incredible speech. Thank you so much. And now it is time for our amazing panel where we'll be talking about innovative and green ways of wastewater treatment, empowering communities and enabling them to have access to clean and safe drinking water. We'll take a few moments for each of the panelists to briefly introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about their background in the industry. Ana Luisa Becerra, founder and CEO of Safe Drinking Water for All. Hi, Shu. Hi. Hi. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's a great pleasure to be here today. And uh, I want to talk more about the lack of access to drinking water. But my experience since I was 15 years old, and I started to have a dream of being a scientist. So I started to realize uh, um, uh, how passionate I was about the theme of water. Uh, passion aimed to understand problems and develop solutions. Uh, and I couldn't believe back then that uh, it's still one third of the global population suffers from access to water and sanitation. And so much technical advances that we already have. And that was how, based on the principle of creating by nature itself, I developed a technology to treat water using just a line, aqua And 
Thank you, Sabin. Oh, thank you, Sabin, for your speech. It was really grateful to, to meet. Uh, I hope to talk to you after. Um, uh, let's have this discussion. Thank you. Philip de Roux, co founder and CEO of Water and Life. Philip, hello. Yeah, th <clears throat> thank you for your invitation. My first experience of social development was uh, in 1995 in Manila. I volunteered for a school sponsorship program for urban poor. And then I joined microfinance project in urban informal settlements. And uh, these experiences have deeply changed me, opened my eyes to the harsh reality of uh, urban poverty. I remember, for example, a few nights in a very small house along the highway, the noisy and polluting trucks going to the nearby pier and the precious water stored in dirty containers bought from illegal resellers. This is where I realized the water was another critical costly issue beside access to credit. There I really understood that the poorer you are, the more you pay for a service of bad quality. Then I came back to France, managed gasoline station, where I had the opportunity to be trained about firefighting, which was very useful. Finally, I joined and developed a, a plumbing company, a pl plumbing social enterprise in Paris. Its social purpose was to hire people with difficult background and accompany them to integrate regular construction company. So strangely enough, merging the experiences of microfinance, community empowerment, firefighting, plumbing, and a bit of Tagalog language allowed the co-creation of Wavy in 2008. Thank you, Philip. And now Pedro Delgado, CEO of Agua Inc. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for, for the invitation. It's an honor for me to be here today. I am so excited. Uh, I am Pedro. I am a passionate social entrepreneur. I started this journey on um, 2003, a uh, long time ago, um, with uh, one mission to with plant treat water. Uh, my small town in the southwest of Spain don't have access to green water. Um, they don't have a wastewater treatment facility. I start to see, oh, let me find a solution. I, I began with this idea to use plants without chemical, without the energy to treat the water. Um, and I did my first project in Mali. That uh, In that project, we uh, only with plants, no chemicals, no energy, only local people, um, local plants, we uh, create drinkable water for the River Niger for 8,000 people. And from that, I start my passion. My passion is uh, water for everyone with uh, local communities, local plants, um, easy solutions. And that's why I'm becoming the CEO of uh, Aqua Fighters first. And after that, the American uh, company that I represented, Awain, that uh, we are currently doing uh, projects around the world to one philosophy. is no waste in the nature. It's only opportunity. And we need to replicate what modern nature tell us. Thank you, Pedro. Anna, I guess what everyone would like to know is why you chose this path. And uh, when you started it, obviously you're very young, and yet you have done so much for the local communities in Brazil. Uh, your work is really inspiring, so we would like to hear your story. Anna, can you hear us? Anna, can you hear us? Mm. Uh, I'm going to go through the question maybe one more time. Yeah. Uh, so I guess what everyone would like to know is why you chose this path. And when you started it all, obviously, you're very young. And yet you have done so much for the local communities in Brazil. Your work is really inspiring. So I'm sure everyone would like to hear more about your story and where it all started.
I think we lost Anna, so maybe we should come back to her shortly. If you don't mind, Philip, we're going to carry on with you. I think we lost the connection. So, uh, Philip, you're doing, um, obviously, we know that um, Anna is helping the local communities in Brazil. You are doing similar work, ensuring access to quality running water for disadvantaged communities. Firstly, could you tell us a bit more about your organization and your mission? Yeah, thank you. Maybe this is important. Uh, Sabine gave a few figures, but you have um, yeah, a few figures in mind. So first, one third of the population still lacks access to uh, affordable uh, and safe running water. 4.5 billion people do not have access to safely managed sanitation. 2 billion people live without proper solid waste management services. And if we focus on the fast growing cities, the challenges are also huge. Today, 50% of the population is urban, 75% in 2050, and 40% of the growth will occur in illegal settlements. Mega cities like Dhaka and Manila, where OAV is working, welcome every year two to 300 new inhabitants. So imagine how creative these municipalities with rather small revenues must be to manage the water, waste, and sanitation services. In deprived neighborhood, fire is also a constant threat. We had a traumatic experience in the beginning of OAV adventure when a fire devastated our first area of intervention because of lack of water also inside, leaving 10,000 people homeless in three hours. So in this context, OAV chose to invest with its partner in this left side populations where the water pipes are illegally tapped, thus contaminating the whole networks. It aims to sustainably improve their living conditions by delivering quality running water to all inhabitants with a fair and inclusive price and an adapted management. Complementary essential services such as waste collection and sanitation can be deployed. For this, OAV creates and manages local social enterprises located in the informal settlements which enables local job creation and proximity with the community and all stakeholders. This new dynamic and the fair access to essential services improve the inhabitants' health, self-esteem, fostering their social and economic inclusion, as well, of course, as cleaning governance and boosting local development. We are, in a way, in the heart of the slum upgrading process, which is, I believe, a key challenge for our century. That's correct. And uh, so you talked about the Philippines. Are you only focusing on communities in the Philippines or uh, are there any specific geographical areas to reach those communities? We, we, we work in the Philippines in, the Philippines in three cities. That was our pilot project because of my experience. And we work also in Bangladesh in two cities, Dhaka and uh, Chattogram. And also we've initiated a, a project in Ivory Coast. Wonderful. So your work is done through empowering the communities, disadvantaged communities in particular. What measures are taken in order to empower these communities and how is it done? You have to know that for, for decades, the main social response for water access and essential services in informal urban settlements was what we call the community-based organization mainly public faucets managed by local leaders or community representatives. But observations, uh, the observations show that uh, this was not completely solving the issues of stored water and contaminated water, the chores of carrying uh, the precious resource, mainly by women and children, the very low repayment of bills to municipal water operator, operators, and the unavoidable conflicts of interest, because uh, in the context is complex, and of course you have some community pressures. Moreover, the outreach was gener generally not complete in the targeted areas, so the illegal business and the water losses were not stopped. That's why um, in this business and urban comp context that are very complex, uh, OAV has a different approach about community empowerment, which is of course, uh, key at all stages. OEV as a social enterprise is the one to invest, build and manage um, the infrastructures, 
permanent infrastructures in coordination with the local operators, community, and authorities. It is providing quality water directly with a tap at home and a corresponding meter targeting to serve the whole area of intervention. For this, OAV has developed a unique um, engineering, I would say, mixing uh, social, technical, digital skills, and the water proximity management allows complementary services such as hygiene, firefighting, we're talking about it, waste and sanitation, which are also concrete ways to empower and mobilize the communities which are so important in this context. Very important indeed. Thank you, Philip, and best of luck with your initiative and organization. I believe we have Anna back, but not uh, through the video. Uh, we can still talk to her, which is going to be uh, just as great. Uh, Anna, can you hear me? Yes, you can. Can, can you hear me? Too? So I'm going to quickly go through the first question that I asked you. Uh, obviously, we would want to hear your inspiring story. I think uh, everyone would like to know uh, why you chose this path and when did it all start? Obviously, you're very young and yet you have done so much for the local communities in Brazil. Uh, your work is really inspiring. So we want to hear your inspiring story as well. Yes, uh, so uh, I was... Say that um, uh, before the problem of the connection started, but I was explaining that uh, when I was a child, my dream was to solve big problems and change the world. And what is one of the bigger problems of the world is the lack of access to drinking water, which affects uh, currently more than 35 million people here in Brazil, there is my country, and the lack of sanitation, which affects more than a um, hundred million people in Brazil. And what's the most obvious consequence of it is the high rate of waterborne disease affecting more than um, uh, 2.33 thousand people per year who are hospitalized for waterborne disease, mostly children. So then when I, in 2013, when I was 15 years old, I started to develop a technology for water water treatment for those who need it the most. And that's how SCW, uh, my startup uh, that uh, is safe with drinking water for all, was created. And today we have uh, uh, eight years of experience in the, this area and five technologies in our portfolio with uh, international awards and recognition from institutions such as the UN, UNESCO and MIT. And having our headquarters and branch in Brazil, where we have uh, again 100 million people with sanitation problem, but our goal is to bring our technology to families around the world. So um, we have this dream. Uh, we know that uh, uh, it's one third of the population. It's too much. So uh, that's why our plan is to have this focus on not only develop the technology to test and make it available and viable for everyone who need it, but also to uh, maybe inspire young people to believe in themselves, to see that this problem, this water problem, it's really important and we do need to be addition uh, with uh, search uh, uh, more, we need to invest more to create more technologies, to give more opportunity for those people because water changes everything. If you don't have safe water, you will have uh, bad education, you will have bad conditions of health. So uh, we know that securing the access to water that is a human right, you, the people and those families will be able to achieve much more in their lives and we do can make a big change. Indeed, uh, I do encourage everyone to also check out your website and watch your video. I really like the little mm -hmm. system that uh, you have de developed yourself. It's, it's quite extraordinary. Anna, there is no life without that water and your work has helped thousands of Brazilians, as you said, to have better quality of life by providing access to water and sanitation. Tell us a bit more about that side of your organization and initiative. Yes, uh, here 
in, in Brazil and several other countries in Asia, Africa, and Latin America, we have um, in common uh, a, a unique climate, a hot climate, and people living in rural area, um, in isolated locations without access to much support to uh, buy filters or do maintenance so several uh, several different water technologies. So we try to create the, this unique technology that Aqualus is with 20 years of durability. So uh, the, the people, the families won't have problems to try to buy another one uh, in a long time. And uh, with the only maintenance being um, cleaning with water and soap and to use the technology, they just need the sun. They don't need anything else. So um, we help those families that uh, most are passing through situation of uh, being sick because of the water. The kids uh, cannot study very well because of it. The adults need to uh, skip their jobs to be with their kids, to take care of them, to uh, uh, take them to the hospitals. So uh, with Aqualus, we see that our impact is much more than water. Um, uh, and uh, right now, as I said before, we, we are also working with other technologies. We have uh, technology that is based on dry toilet technology, so you can use the toilet without needing the water. We have a technology to clean gray water uh, with using plants, and we are building a solar dissemination uh, a technology that will also just use the sun energy to make uh, salt water available for those families mm -hmm. that doesn't have any other sorts of, um, of uh, fresh water. So uh, our impact uh, right now, it's about uh, 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 13,000 people in Brazil. And our goal for the next four years is to achieve a million people impacted, not only in Brazil, but maybe um, in other countries, in North America, in Africa, or even Asia. Uh, we, we always want to dream big, but still, one million is uh, a just a small quantity of people that we know that we can help. It's something that uh, being part of change now is really, it's a step for us to maybe delivering this information, maybe attracting more partners and um, people that can help us somehow to achieve this huge goal of making safe drinking water for all. Thank you, Anna. And now, Pedro, your company offers a new solution to water treatment in comparison to the conventional way. How is your method more sustainable? First, uh, Shoka, allow me to congratulate my colleagues. It's an honor to be in this panel. You guys really inspire me. Um, I know I am not alone in this journey. And now let me go to your question, Shoka. Um, we, 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 long time ago, we start to look this conventional technology that use chemicals that no, no way uh, someone in Masai Mara or in Mali can run because they use energy, they use chemical, it's nobody understands. Um, and we start to, to see how plants, they can use uh, this potential that the power of nature have. And we see many technologies like a conventional uh, um, uh, wetland, constructed wetland, and we become with the idea to put plants to flo flotate, to eliminate the problem of clogging, eliminate the problem of space, and eliminate to, uh, the problem of the waste stabilization ponds that they need like a 10 square meter per people. Like a, we can go for one square meter per people. Um, and we start the journey. Our technology is based on plants. Plants are everywhere. We use typhus, fragmites. We have uh, open source uh, 3,000 plants uh, that we are uh, open to, to share to everyone. And we have a matrix that is a device that we put on top of the water. And we use the, the, a, plant flow, a plant flow system that allow, for example, uh, the last project we did in Masai Mara, uh, the Masai uh, in Embo. It's a closed loop system that uh, then grow the plants, the plants treat the water, and we can reuse 80% of the water. 
imagine, Masai Mara, the tourists is growing by a lot. Um, they are discharging contaminated water. Um, if you have the solution that with community plans, um, uh, empowerment, you can solve a problem. Uh, you have a technology that, that can scale. And it's not like a small project that we did the same thing in Dominican Republic uh, for 40,000 people that, uh, in, in a housing project that because if you can pay a service, even a small percentage, you become a citizen. And um, one of our mentors say, Paul Pollack said, it, look, the key of sustainability is uh, that people can pay, that people can afford, because if you give them tools that they can uh, sustain and they can maintain, they, they become immediately uh, uh, citizens of, of that area. And that's what we did. We, we go around the world, we create a, a, a selection of plants that this plant, they are growing naturally. We don't need to bring any plant. We introduce the microorganisms at the root of the plants and we create this hydroponic root mass that is like a constructed floating wetland that uh, can put water. For example, uh, in River Niger, we uh, decrease child mortality by 75% and we eliminate cholera and we produce drinkable water for 8,000 people from the River Niger to drinkable water parameter without chemicals without energy, only with plants and with local people. And so you mentioned the local people. So I realized that the key point is working with the community, correct? Training the locals to run the system, which I find quite incredible about this project. How does this get managed and organized, working with locals and training them to use um, this system? Our methodology is uh, show them how with the seed they can grow a plant and with that plant they can treat the water and with that, with that plant they can produce uh, food stuff for the animals or they can produce uh, uh, things to make it. How a circular economy, how waste is an opportunity and how then they are value because they are, they are there already. The plants are there, the waste are there, everyone poo every day. You have people, you have plants, and you have poop. It's perfect. You have the solution. You have the components that you need. And for that, we start today. Every gardener can run a wastewater facility. That's our philosophy. How a gardener or agriculture with, with no knowledge of uh, water treatment, chemical, they can say, look, today you will run the facility. And we did with the Tuareg in Mali, with the people of the uh, community in Dominican Republic, in Bahamas, in Kenya, in Gambia, in Morocco, because plants grow like people. And we use that philosophy, we use the power of nature, harnessing what nature tells us, because it's, it's nothing that we start. Since the Egyptians start to treat water with plants, since 5,000 years ago, that were, they observed how plants have the capacity to, to put fixed biofilms on the roots and the roots decrease the char contaminated at the low. And we, what we do is increase, uh, boost that, that philosophy, but communities understand perfect because the plants are there and the problems are there. And when you have the capacity to see a problem is opportunity and you can, from wastewater, create drinkable water and, and grow your garden, boom, that's it. That's how the community is with you. And, and from that moment, the project is sustainable. And that's what we are doing in Masai Mara with Embo. It's a closer look. Thank system. you, Pedro. Wonderful. Thank you, Pedro, Philip, and Anna for your contribution. And now our exclusive interview with one of the world leading water scientists, Dr. Carver Madani. Carver is an environmental scientist, educator and activist working at the interface of science, policy and society. He is known internationally for his work on integrating game theory into water resources management. He is the former deputy head of Iran's Department of Environment 
and former Vice President of the UN as Environment Assembly Bureau. He is the Visiting Professor at Imperial College London and Henry Hartrice Senior Fellow at the Macmillan Centre for International and Area Studies of Yale University. Carver, it is a pleasure to have you with us today. You should know that my view on water issues and the water-related environmental uh, challenges have massively changed because of your work and activism in, in the field. Uh, I know that the issue of water uh, has been undermined massively in global con uh, conversations. And I'm very pleased that we have dedicated a session to this very important topic at Change Now this year. Dr. Madani, clean water is a human right and has been recognized by the UN since 2010. And yet water-related challenges, as mentioned earlier, seem to not have been given the attention it deserves. Why do you think that is? Uh, thanks for uh, the invitation and having me here. I'm glad that my publications and work um, had, had some effect on, on uh, your work and what you're doing and, and how you are informing people. I'm also glad that Change Now is now covering water and is recognizing it as a uh, as an important subject, which has been really overlooked. You know, we heard from from the panelists about the work, the other panelists about the work they are doing. Uh, what we need to learn and 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 understand and appreciate is is that there is a big difference from between physical water unavailability or physical water shortage and and economic water shortage. Uh, we commonly hear the word poverty next to next to water shortage but in in the case of poor communities the problem is not necessarily the lack of um, water in, in you know in terms of natural availability but it what it means is is that the governments and 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 those in charge of, of of managing water in those regions have not been able to provide water to the citizens because of economic problems because of, of political issues and and um, other struggles which are very common in in some of the developing nations especially if they are run you know being run undemocratic and 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 uh, they're suffering from um, unsustainable development and uneven development. Um, so this is an important issue where we we see water is not being recognized as a human right. We also see other rights of the humans not being respected, and 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 that reminds us the important fact that that if we want to solve the problems of the developing nations of of the glo global south of the whole world, we have to understand the problems on the ground and what people are doing. In many cases, the problem is not the, you know, technology. It is, is, it is only the lack of governance systems and, and, and the way wa water is valued in, in communities and water is being managed by, by the system. And I think this pandemic taught us this in, in the very first days when the, the smart people uh, you know, in, in, in our side of the world came up with so the solution of washing hands they forgot the fact that there are many people on this planet who don't have access to water for their you know sanitation and 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 health and this is something that we dismiss a lot of times that the amount of water we talk about when it comes to human rights is the the amount of, you know we're talking about um 50 liters of water or or so and that is that is not massive and that is something that that we you know we have to work on the world's population almost uh, quadrupled in the last century, but demand for water grew at double that rate. Over the next 50 years or so, it is estimated that most people and uh, more more people and changing lifestyles will need yet another 55% more water. How will we and how can we balance demand for water while producing the food, goods and power needed for the future? You mentioned the key word here, lifestyle. Um, you know, unless we change this lifestyle, we cannot, you know, do that. There is a limit to growth and water is definitely a big limit to, to growth, as we have seen 
on this in many parts of the world. Look at the Middle East right now, the, the problem that have arise because of putting too much, you know, the pressure of economy on on water. Not not only you know, water not only provides food for us, not only it provides um you know, health and, and safety and sanitation and food and, and energy to us. But also, it, you know, there are lots of people whose jobs are dependent on, on water. Uh, but this 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 way of development cannot continue. And if we are actually helping some of the, you know, poor communities in the world, we also need to understand this and 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 try to come up with solutions which are different. Now, uh, now we, we are you are also mentioning something about the demand and that is also an important thing because a lot of times our solutions are very supply oriented we we come up with technologies we invent technologies and we are proud of the new technologies that we develop we came up with with the technology of of pump pumps and, and pumping groundwater, then we build dams, then we build desalination plants, then we transfer water from one location to another. And, 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 and now we are thinking about even taking a water out of air. These are good. These solutions can be used, but they cannot completely address this, this su supply demand gap. We need policy interventions and technological innovations. And most importantly, a change of the way we run our economies and lifestyle to cut the demand meaningfully and 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 get the, the world out of this this water bankruptcy situation um this uh, my next question might be a little bit similar to what you've just said because you mentioned the technology so as technology advances with new solutions for our existing problems just what you said um we can see that the balance is sort of being interrupted drip irrigation comes to mind and how uh, water conservation and irrigation for instance can increase water use so we need the balance here as well what do you think we should do just talk us through that as well yeah i mean let, let me explain this because this this might be you know shocking to people uh, i i read an article on iran's water resources today and i i you know i saw a solution being proposed by uh, someone there as as you know drip irrigation you know can can solve the the narrative that drip irrigation can solve the problem and this is this is this is um, you know, an old saying, this is not new. But what we have learned is that wherever we, we increase water supply, no matter what, what mechanism, you dig a well or, or build a dam or, or uh, transfer water or desalinate water, you increase supply. When you increase supply, there is a perception of water availability and water becomes an engine of growth. With growth, there would be development. With development, there is, there is change of lifestyle, population growth, more demand for food, changing from, from you know, vegetables to meat diet and, and, and increasing demand. So, so, so what happens is that the you know the the your investment in the supply actually increases is can increase the gap between supply and demand in the long run or let's say it result in the demand demand you know growth this doesn't mean that technologies are bad um, this means that technologies must be implemented together with other other things especially e economic and policy interventions which make sure that 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 you know the the demand is also regulated at the same time now speaking of irrigation efficiency what we learned in the world was that when we changed the irrigation efficiency to drip irrigation replace flood irrigation with drip irrigation yes it is good because it it increases the water efficiency of 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 of, of use now so so the you know water efficiency now what happens is that before we have flood irrigation, part of the water was getting evaporated, part of the water was getting infiltrated in in, in, in you know in our, our underground resources and going into springs and rivers and so on. Now, as a result of drip, drip irrigation we, and, and too much efficiency, we lose our return flow. It's good for evaporation, but we lose our return flow. So so then farmers are also smart. They 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 realize they have warm water available. So they either expand their land area, you know, farming area, or switch their crops. So they go after you know crops which are thirstier. So our water use increases as the result of this this technology technologic improvement now 
Is that bad? No. Technologic improvement can be implemented. But if you implement it without regulating water, without metering it, you know, some of the solutions that we had and, you know, um, we, we heard in this uh, in the pre uh, the panel discussion in your session. Um, so these solutions must be accompanied by by this sort of in, invention. And most importantly, we have to realize water rights. We have to realize, like you know, the the extent um, of water withdrawal. What is sustainable? You cannot withdraw more than your renewable water rate, and and so many other things. Which, if we have the complete bundle, we can improve the situation. If we don't we can actually exacerbate this situation and make it worse. And as this is, this is proven already. As a person in the field of sustainability and sustainable development, I'm always cautious about the concept of virtual water and water footprint, for instance, in, in the food and agriculture or energy sector. A hidden concept, as it were, something I believe we need to pay more attention to, but I don't think that we do. Can you talk us through that? A, a very good question, and I think, you know, it also, this is connected to your first question. Why haven't we uh, done enough for water mm -hmm. as, as an, as an essential, essential element of life? I mean, it, it's a resource we cannot survive without. Uh, one of the reasons is that we, we don't know or, or uh, constantly think about where water is being used. Um, most of the water in the world goes into the agricultural sector to produce food. Um, so, so uh, any 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 product that we use, uh, you know, coming out of industry, coming out of out, um, uh, out of the the agricultural sector, no matter what, um, uses some amount of water. So during the process of producing a product or even a service, some water is is being used. Now that water, the embedded water in the product, is not being recognized by us, and it's not even being priced properly. Right? We buy food. Bread is is pretty cheap. Uh, compared, you know, to its value, food is cheap. Governments around the world have to keep food cheap and available because they care about the survivals of their citizens. And without fee food, people die. So the end product is very cheap, and we don't value and think about the, the material which goes into the production. Now, so any product we use it has some embedded water or or virtual water. Now. Where this, where, where does your product come come from? So the, the the shirt I'm wearing might be coming from somewhere in in East Asia, for example. In East Asia, people have have irrigated cotton. Uh, some water has gone into the production of this, and now I buy it, buy this in the United States and wear it without without thinking what sort of water has gone into this. Where is it coming from? And and if the people over there have access to sustainable water resources or not? Are they water bankrupt? or not the food i eat whatever it's delicious i don't think about it the meat i might be eating i don't think about these things now every product that we we think we we use comes from somewhere in the world and if we think about it you know water is being vir virtually traded so every product has water footprint and if you don't think about this water footprint then you don't really think about the water rights of of people now if we start thinking about this if you start you know noticing this and even asking about this questioning you know asking for a label which provides that information then we can think about the justice implications of what is happening i buy this shirt very cheap and the farmer in east asia never get paid properly to protect the water and the governments even in those regions don't get paid properly and 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 we see a situation that we are seeing today the poor countries of the world many poor countries of the world are supplying food to us which is very cheap compared to what they buy from us which is technology and service this is totally unfair this is this is unjust and this attitude of us must must change we don't have to necessarily travel to africa and east asia to solve problems we can solve the problems it where we live if we think about these things and change our lifestyle and the way we think Carver, thank you for your valuable contribution. It's always a pleasure listening to you. It is indeed imperative to gain the participation of experts in the field. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our keynote speaker, Sabine, and our wonderful panelists. I hope our audience enjoyed our discussion on this very important topic. Thanks for joining us.